Hey guys, I'm here on the campus of Mizzou, and yeah, I'm not here for a class, but I did come here to interview an astronaut, Linda Godwin. She is a part-time professor here now, but she has been in space for about 40 days total in her lifetime. She had some great insight, and I thought you guys would all really enjoy this interview. Uh, so I'm Professor Emeritus and also still an adjunct. What do you teach? That class class is called Physics of Space Exploration. So it's just applying some of the basic principles to how do you begin to move around, you know, and using Newtonian sort of right. physics. And you're a good person to teach <laughs> this because you've been to space. Yeah, and I like the way it's really all physics applied, of course. Is it crazy for some of your students that you're an actual astronaut? <laughs> I, I do believe they enjoy that. You know, I don't think I've aged out of that. <laughs> Even though it's been a while, you know, since I was an act active astronaut, but they do seem to like it. I think it's a little less effective in the online, but at the same time, that gives me a lot of flexibility to, since I'm mostly retired, right. to control my schedule. I also want to get your background, you know, kind of how you became an astronaut. Where did that all begin, that, that you know, desire? When I was growing up, we were just beginning the human spaceflight program. So I was fascinated, you know, by watching it. We landed on the moon the summer before my senior year in high school, so that was a ways back. But, you know, all of this, I liked math and science. I don't know how, how entwined that was with what was going on with the space news, but I know I had an interest in both. I also really liked reading science fiction when I was a kid. So I had dreams, but I grew up in a small, uh, in a, outside of a, a few miles outside of a small town in southeast Missouri called Jackson. I didn't see a path. I mean, I didn't realistically know what I could do. <laughs> Access to information was very different, and so uh, it was hard to know what was out there. But I liked math and science, and I started, I majored in physics and math in college at Southeast Missouri State, which is in Cape Girardeau, Missouri. And then I came here to Mizzou for grad school. And when I was a kid, they were all men, primarily military pilots. And so I really didn't see any intersection with that at all. But while I was in grad school here, NASA announced they were hiring astronauts for the shuttle program. So again, this goes back a ways, but it was the first time they were actively encouraging women to apply and should that have happened a lot earlier, of course, but you know, it happened when it happened and they were um, hiring more science astronauts, which they did right at the end of Apollo, they hired some science astronauts. But this time there was a lot more, uh, you know, encompassing of people and I, st I looked at my, my background and I've realized I fit the eligibility requirements, you know, so, you know, general good health, eyesight, education. So I started applying and really the first time I sent an application in, I wasn't finished with grad school yet either. Anyone who's ever, you know, been to grad school knows sometimes it takes longer. I really was two years away from finishing, but I applied again the year they were having another astronaut selection and I applied the year I was leaving. I got an interview, which was you know, stupendous for me, got to go down to NASA Johnson Space Center. I did not get in, but they offered me a job to go down and work there, and I had two job offers. I picked that one, and I moved to Houston, Texas, and then applied again, later got into the program. So really, it was perseverance, it was my education, the timing of opportunity. Right. Um, but had I not been in science and physics, and you know, they, we needed some kind of background in engineering, medicine, science right. and an advanced degree was really helpful. I got my pilot's license while I was here as a grad student, did some extra tutoring. All those things, you know, it's hard to say. There's not a formula for, if you look at all the people who found their way to the NASA astronaut program, it's an interesting group. No one usually gets in on their first application. <laughs> Is that true? Um, I don't actually know the statistics on that. And, and I was on three selection boards you know, where we interview, interview candidates and everything. And I definitely, you know, can say that we, some people do get in on their first try. Yeah. And then there's like, you know, there's some real, uh, like six or seven tries, yeah. not, not too many of those, but there are some, you know, two or three is not uncommon, but definitely we get some people. I don't know why it plays out that way. But to get to an interview is, a, is really the biggest step. That means they're more interested at that point in who you are and, and, what they think of you. I did not realize how influential that interview was when I was going through it myself. But later on from the other side of the table, 
had a different perspective. But if you get that far, it means you've, you've passed all the other wickets, you know, unless there's a medical disqualification, which can happen to people. And I think that's probably more stringent now with long duration flights. Uh, and they can afford to be picky because so many people apply. Did anything for, throw you off in the interview? This is this memory, you know, it's so old from when I interviewed and then, you know, the experiences of being listening to a lot of interviewees and I realized that by the time they go through a few weeks of these, there are little inside jokes that circulate among the board. Like they'll ask something and everybody's perking up and say, oh, this is always a good question. And so it's a little disconcerting to realize there's some humor going on. They, they tend to ask a lot of the same set of questions and sometimes the same person will do it and other people have heard some amusing answers and so they, I don't know, they develop their own personality, the yeah. board does. How long does that whole inter you process, or at least for you, how long did it take? Well, the actual interview, really, it's an hour. I mean, it's not it's not like a grilling or anything. I'm just trying to get an impression. But but the interview we is a week. It's five days in terms of what they call the NASA interview, because that includes a lot of medical tests, psychological tests, tours around the center, encouraged to meet and talk with other people in the astronaut office. And so it's kind of the composite of all of that that comes together. Were you scared to go to space? I feel like it sounds really scary. <laughs> you know, it's interesting because, um, no, I mean, I th uh, I had a healthy respect for the risks and everybody should. And I was always glad when the ascent was over, sort of, maybe because, well, orbit to me was the, the place you aspired to get to and, and more, that's where the real work happened and, and looking at our planet and all of that. And I think we all live our lives thinking it's not gonna happen to us today. So there's a little bit of that too. You know, are you scared to get on an airplane because, you know, Sometimes. maybe there is a crash. I know, you know, you may have just read about a crash somewhere in the world, but you still think, oh, it's not going to happen to this one today right, or something. Right. But it's like you could ramp that up maybe a little bit when you think about a space launch. I think, you know, there's always going to be some risk. I thought about it a lot. You know, on my last flight, I had an 18 month old daughter. You know, my husband was very familiar with it because he had been an astronaut. And he said, you know, it's harder to watch somebody launch than to be in it. You know, if you're in it, you have trained, you're focused, you just are ready to go. But watching, you're kind of like so much disconnected from being able to do anything about it. So right. it's hard to watch. And I, you know, I watched some friends launch and I kind of had that feeling that it's weird to be on the observation side. Describe to me what it's like watching. <laughs> uh, oh gosh, uh, it is um, a feeling of being on top of a lot of power. It is not deafening because we have a communication cap on and a helmet. We had those on in the shuttle. But it is a lot of power and force and rumbling, particularly that, you know, the first two minutes on the solid rocket boosters, we know that there's not a lot you can do to your off the booster. And then if something went wrong, there were, some, there were options after that. So it's just a very powerful feeling, it, particularly the first time, the culmination of years of effort. So you just want to go. You know, if they pulled the crew, which they do for a launch, you know, they always, they pull the control center, the launch control center, they'll, you know, they ask, they ask the flight director in Houston, who's pulled everybody. They ask the crew if everybody's go, range safety. But if you just ask the crew, I think they'd be go just about every time because who wants to crawl out, you know, go out and do that whole suit up and get back in again and they've just been waiting for this and they're so primed to go. So it's good we have lots of uh, experts looking at everything, yeah. you know, really making the call. And if the crew said, no, we're not ready, then they wouldn't. I don't think any crew has said they're not go for launch. <laughs> I was selected in 85, okay. but then we formally moved from candidates to astronauts in 86. Okay, that's, yeah, that's And I think that's where they start the counting. Yeah. But, um, I know, I mean, when I just got in in 85, I assumed I was in. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, the biggest hurdle was getting selected in the first place. Yeah. And then after that, it was a little unclear, you know, how you finally got selected to a flight. Our training, like way back then, it didn't include Russian training, you know, our space station training. Not that the shuttle wasn't complicated enough, but it was, you know, certainly focused on that and a lot of other peripherals around that. So I, you know, I, I just always felt that if I waited long enough, I'd get to fly, you know, unless something medically happened. I didn't really worry about it. I mean, getting in, I was willing to wait. It's a good place to be. It was a good office to be in, supporting other missions, the simulations, you know, learning the robotics, the spacewalks, the shuttle system. And you've done spacewalks. Mm -hmm. What's that like? That is a little surreal. And it's almost like you know, looking back and think, did I really do that? And it's a lot of effort, not just for the astronauts going out, 
But a team, there's a lot of training that involves a lot of people to get ready. Yes. Um, you know, the whole suit, the people who maintain the suits, the people who run the simulations in the water tank, some of the vacuum chamber runs. But amazingly, I was surprised the first time I went out that I didn't feel risky or anything. You know, I thought, I, I feel like, I kind of thought about it briefly, focusing mostly on what we were doing, but I felt like I have a lot of confidence in the suit. And I guess all the hours of training kind of pay off and it is, it's in a unique environment, a little frustrating to work within the confines of that suit to do tasks that would be really easy if you were standing here and doing it. But it's a bit more of a challenge when you've got a body mass now that's equivalent, you know, there would be equivalent on the surface of the earth to around four or 500 pounds or something. And so you've still got, of course it doesn't have weight up there, but it has right. mass. Right. And so you've got that momentum to deal with, body positioning, working in the gloves. But they had to be made to fit everybody from just a few sizes of torsos and lower, uh, the lower body part. So it wasn't optimal for everyone, but they did pretty good at fitting it. What was like the hardest moment for you of your career? Emotionally, it was probably, you know, leaving people. My first couple of flights, and I was single, it was a little easier than I wasn't, and I had my daughter, and then every time you do it, it's risk versus gain, right? Yeah. Even though you, one wants to go again. So there's always, I, I didn't ignore the risk, um, aware of it. You just kind of put it in the back of your mind when it's finally time to go and one has dealt with it. And the f most physically hard thing, I mean, I don't know, probably all the EVA work and prep, and it's all doable. And we didn't have any major issues on any of my flights. You know, we had some things happen small thing, you know, like a jet fell off on one mission, wasn't sure if we could do the rendezvous, but they worked around that. But no real serious issues, thankfully, because... No Houston, we've had a problem moment. No, no, didn't have any of those. And, you know, we're not beyond having those, you know, yeah. so that is always out there right. for anybody who thinks about going as safe as you can make it. The ascent and entry have these challenges, so do the long duration, you know, it's just, it's just the nature of going to space. There are risks. I also really appreciated some of you on my Patreon submitted some questions for me to ask Linda. So let's get into some of those questions. What were the most memorable parts of the STS-37 GRO deployment? Engine start, three good engines up and burning, two, one. Yeah, so GRO was Grant Gamma Ray Observatory. And after it was successfully deployed, it became the Arthur Holly Compton Gamma Ray Observatory. So the neatest part, I mean, I got to use the robotic arm on the shuttle to grapple it and it was the most massive payload we'd moved with the arm up to that point so getting to actually put the arm on it you know ra raise it up above the cargo bay while it went through all of its tests and checkout and so just going to be a part of that team that had um, so many great people working on it and Gamma Ray Observatory really changed Sadly, it's not in orbit now, but it really changed what we know about gamma ray bursts, for example, that their origins are from beyond our galaxy and just all kinds of cool science. It didn't get, it was one of NASA's four great observatories along with Hubble, and then there was an infrared and an ultraviolet telescope. But Hubble, of course, has visual right. images that can really be used, whereas collecting gamma rays is more binning the data, you know, collecting right. it, counting it, it doesn't produce these images. So I never really got that kind of coverage, but it was really a very successful payload. The fact that the high gain antenna got stuck and couldn't and would not deploy, which was gonna greatly compromise the mission. And we had two people on our crew, Jerry Ross and Jay Apt, who had trained as a contingency spacewalk to go out and they went out and were able to free that antenna before we deployed it. So the human interaction on orbit was very critical to a successful deploy of Gamma Ray Observatory. And I, you know, I, so I felt like, these people, not only the astronomers, you know, but then the people who designed and built it and tested it had devoted years and years of their life to that getting on orbit and we got to touch it for a little while. I, I love being a part of that team. What was it like being one of the first shuttle crews on Mir? What surprised you most about the way Russians did things? <laughs> yeah, so we had several shuttle flights and ended up docking with the Mir space station, which was the last standalone space station the Russians had. You know, what surprised me the most about it, probably from the start of my career, is that we were doing it at all. Because when I started with NASA, it was still the Soviet Union. We had no connection with them. Then everything fell and it all changed. And so the idea was we were going to start collaborating with Russia and flying to their Mir space station was a way to begin that. Oh, I still remember when we launched and we did our rendezvous sequence where we have to just match altitude and speeds in orbit and do this so, kind of complicated, but we know how to do it, match up in space 
and rendezvous and doc um, was that as we got closer and closer, here's actually this strange, kind of strange looking station in orbit around our planet and we're going to go inside it. And it was like finally going somewhere, you know, like almost like knocking on somebody's door finally and saying, hey, we've arrived, you know. And uh, we had seen a, a mock-up of one of the modules, some of it, you know, in Russia on one trip. And, but I just, you know, when I got inside for the first time, and it takes a while after the docking to get that all set up, but we got a tour of their station. Uh, I just remember looking around and thinking, um, gosh, there's so much in here and cables and everything. I'm not, I want to be really careful. And they wanted us to be very careful how we moved and not grabbing anything. If you were in the module and turned in, in, the, in the node and went out of one module and turned into another one, they were often clocked differently. So there were four ways that you could come in and go out and it wouldn't be the same orientation and all of a sudden everything's like 90 degrees off. So I found that a little interesting. I also thought it had a little bit of a musty smell, which I'm sure once you're inside, I think our shuttle did too at the end of every mission, but you get, you can't really do smells if you're immersed in them for a yeah. while. You, they yeah. lose their, uh, but I remember thinking that and just thinking, you know, I'm on a Russian space station. Who knew I'd ever get to do this? But what kind of studies or concentration in undergrad work would best proceed a goal of astronaut candidacy? I have two teenage granddaughters that would be interested. Wow. Okay. First of all, is this got to be something you really want to do anyway? Because it has to be part of your passion, you know, or it won't really work out probably. Um, but it is still, uh, you know, science, engineering, and math. So if you're in high school, you know, take all the math and science. So engineering, if anything is offered like that, it really depends on where you live. I mean, some schools have quite a large curriculum. Truthfully, when they interview people, they're looking for people who, what else have they done? Uh, right. You know, are they interested in sports? Are they interested in anything extreme? Are they interested in flying? And, right. you know, where have they been? It just you don't want to just be all study and know nothing else. But I would suggest reading all the biographies of you know the last few astronaut classes. I'm always impressed when I read them. You know, like people have done all these other things, and yeah. unfortunately, it is very competitive. Why not work toward it if that's yeah. what you really want? If you have any interest or plans to return to space with <laughs> any of the new or emerging commercial options. No, I could answer that pretty, I mean, not because I wouldn't necessarily want to go back, although there's a risk every time and I have been there. But, you know, to go to orbit with, you know, some of these companies that are brokering flights, like, you know, using SpaceX or whatever, I think it's 60 or $70 million. Uh, I mean, there's just not a chance. What if you had, for some reason, a free ride? I would consider a free ride. <laughs> But I think the chances of that happening are about zero, so I'll stick with my original answer. It's not that it's not interesting and, you know, it would be great in many ways to be back and get to see the Earth again. And, but I want to be productive, too, and you know, I want to be doing something up right. there. Sometimes I, we got to take our favorite music, and that will bring it back sometimes. If I listen to something that was oh. a song I took along and looked out the window and everything, it's just like, I, I loved all this. Every mission was different in terms of science, what we got to do, and, you know, got to go to two space stations and the Gamma Ray Observatory and an Earth science mission. And all of those individually had their own really cool things that we did. But some of my favorite time on every mission was having some alone time, listening to music, and just watching an orbit as we went on our planet in 90 minutes. Because you could see city lights where people were, you know, you could see lightning. It was just calm and peaceful. And you do find yourself thinking, why can't we all get along? I mean, because up here, we share that planet. That's the most huge commonality thing we could ever have you know, to take care of this planet. And, and we just have, we just have struggled with that through millennia. So <laughs> you see it from up there and you think, oh my gosh, you know, we should just, Everyone why can't, every, if everybody could actually go see that, and maybe you could take some of the other elements out of what drives a lot of conflict. Um, I mean, it would just change everybody, I think. And the overview, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of trouble in the details, you know, and you can't just say, well, that can just all go away. But there is a real overview effect of, what are we really doing here? <laughs> what music did you bring? Oh my gosh. So I had, you know, some of the older favorite artists, I guess. You know, I had, uh, I had Judy Collins. I had John Denver. I think I had some Sting. Oh, there's many others. I just can't think of, all, of them all right now. Uh, okay. I had some Enya. I mean, that actually, you know, if you like it, kind of that kind of background music where it was just very, um, 
I guess I didn't want to listen to a lot of energetic music when I'm trying to watch the world go by. So yeah. I kind of had these other choices. More atmospheric. More atmospheric, yeah. yeah. So that will bring it just back That's like that. What do you think about the new private commercial space companies offering astronaut training versus NASA training? Well, first of all, they have to train our astronauts, some that are going up in, in uh, you know, SpaceX and hopefully now Boeing very soon, human-rated vehicles. Uh, so they have to do that. And, then, and also they train their own customers who are going to fly how to survive and, you know, and basically get along and live. You know, whether it's the pretty brief suborbital flight or not as many opportunities to do full orbital, but there are things everybody has to learn. So I think they do have to train astronauts in their own vehicles because they know them and they know how to operate the subsystems and what it's going to take to use all the things that humans need to, you know, maintain their body in orbit. You know, NASA training right now is it's years for the space station and learning Russian and robotics and spacewalks and all of the science that goes up there. So they're kind of two different, you know, paths totally. of, of needs. Well, especially because some of these companies just want to give people the, um, you know, experiential right. yeah. ride. So they're not going to have this. No, but you, you know, so you're going to have to know some safety things on what happens if this happens. Well, how are you going to react? You know, how do you, if you're up there long enough, then, a, you know, not talking suborbital here, but if you go up for a real mission, how to use a bathroom, how do you cook your food, you know, how are you going to sleep, how's your body cycle, how are you going to do hygiene, how are you, what not to do, don't touch, <laughs> you know, some things you don't want to do. If you're on the shuttle, you know, be like, don't open the hatch. <laughs> I should say it opened inward, which meant the pressure from the inside held it closed, whereas the side hatch opened outward, which meant the inside pressure would blow it open if you ever loosened it. And so we actually put a pen and locked that on orbit so nobody could ever accidentally do anything. Do you watch For All Mankind? I I have watched a few episodes. I have not gotten back to it. Okay. It was pretty hard to watch uh, the U.S. not make it to the moon first. Yeah. <laughs> Even though newbie did, but everybody said it gets really good, and okay. so I need to finish watching that. I have, I've watched some of it. Mark asks, on terra firma, if you lose something, you can look on the floor of horizontal <laughs> surface in space. Do you have any funny anecdotes about losing something in space and finding it in the oddest place much later? Well, I was looking for something every day. I mean, it is true. It can float out of one's pocket, even though we use a lot of Velcro and things, and it just would be gone, and it could be incredibly hard. I've heard stories of people, uh, like if they had to fire the jets a little bit to like raise or you know, change an attitude, then that little thrust, things would come floating out, you know, from things where they had been tucked under like the the little well underneath in the in the cockpit or something. Uh, we would find a lot of things on the air filters because eventually, but not but not all air circulates the same. And there was one interesting case. I was not on either of these flights where somebody lost their watch on a flight and it floated out on the next mission. After being thoroughly, you know, inspected and Whoa. turned around on the ground. So That's things crazy. can really hide. Yeah. Uh, and I was always looking for something. Moose <laughs> Thompson says, SEMO is my alma mater too. Oh. Who, if anyone from high school or college inspired you? Yeah, I had really good teachers for science and math in high school. And I think that just helped set me on the right path. I didn't know anyone. Well, I, so, you know, initially I was just going into science and math. And so I think the teachers I did have in high school, I had Mr. Seaball, Mrs. Lamont for science and math, uh, other teachers too, and, and professors I really liked in college. So that was kind of the science and math. But in terms of like thinking about NASA or astronaut, I didn't really have someone I looked to for that. Were you aware of or interested in the space program before Apollo? Well, yes, because I was, you know, I watched the Mercury and Gemini flights. To me, to go back before that, I mean, you'd be going back where I was so young, I didn't know anything. <laughs> you know, this all started when I was in elementary school. Right, right. So yeah, that's my first awareness of is we were doing it with the early program. So definitely that was pre-Apollo. And I will also go back to reading books. You know, if I had any, I don't know if we read more back then. I hope people still read a lot, but I found other people's imaginations very inspiring when I would read some of that. On STS-37 when GRO was deployed, could you sense it given GRO's mass? Yeah, obviously this questioner, you know, 
this person with the question knows that it was very massive payload. And I, the software was updated more later, but when we were using the, the shuttle arm for this, the characteristics of the math, mass really induced some motion in other axes that were not commanded. And that's a lot to go into, and it has to do with the mechanical joints and the servos and the rate, uh, you know, command rate and everything, the way when you move this hand controller, how did all the joints move? Because they all had to react against the mass. So that we knew was going to happen, and that was unique. When it was had been up there and ready to actually let it go, uh, the real thing was to very carefully open the snares and back off the end effector without nudging that payload at all. You know, so we trained to do that, and then we backed off and left it. So really, the actual deploy was not so much mass awareness, but getting it up there was. How do you see the change in space junk over time? Oh, it's going to increase, you know. And so these packages that we put on Mirror and that were picked up by astronauts on a later docking flight, shuttle docking flight, uh, were exposed to space and they brought back both things that might happen to zip by and got caught in some kind of gel. And also it was there to detect what's outgassing from the station yet, the Mirror itself. That was interesting, you know, to get to do that. And I read some of the results when they came back. But in general, we had a window ding actually on that same flight, STS-37, on the side hatch window that left a little divot. It's kind of like what you get in your windshield if you get a rock. You know, you'd see that. And the, and the, the window panes on the shuttle were multi-pane, so they, they were built to be very sturdy, but yet this left a divot, and it was probably the size of a grain of sand. You would think if they're in the same orbit, we'd have the same velocity, but you can have an intersection with something that's in an elliptical orbit that has a higher speed, you know, when it comes around to intersect. In general, what happens in low Earth orbit, it cleans itself out because there's just enough small amount of atoms and molecules there that it will, almost anything will eventually decay if it hangs around in low Earth orbit enough. Uh, the higher stuff can stay for a long time. And so we don't need people blowing things up up there just to show they can do it and making all these little pieces. And everything that's put in space now is supposed to have a plan for end of lifetime, that it's either deorbited, it's moved to a higher orbit where at least it's not going to break up. Um, you have to have a plan for what you're going to do before all the propellant is gone now. Oh, at least, how enforceable is that internationally? I don't know, but that's what should happen. Right. Did the space shuttle feel crowded after being there for more than a week? You know, it didn't. It didn't feel that crowded. Um, and a couple of times, well, one time we had a laboratory in the back that we worked in so we could float through this tunnel and be in, an, be in more short sleep, you know, even more pressurized environment. But I think it was the fact it was three dimensions. The windows in the shuttle were pretty good for seeing out. We had the overhead windows, the forward windows. On the mid-deck, not so much, just the side hatch. But in the cockpit, because we could see out the aft, overhead, and forward windows, that created to me a more of a sense of space. I would not want to be closed in, maybe. And then two times I was on, you know, docked to a space station where we could go, particularly the International Space Station, you know, we in and out all the time because we were unloading a module that would be docked, we put on one of the docking ports. So we had that space to move around in. But the shuttle in general, three dimensions, makes a big deal of difference. Um, that's good. Yeah, because you can go over somebody, you can just go up here and look down, you yeah. know. <laughs> With having been in space, what is it like to imagine going to Mars? Oh, um, a long journey. It's going to be months long. You know, if we went with, can, you know, pretty much the way we send our probes now, it's going to be around six months. Uh, I think with constant thrust, you might get it down to a month but you'd see Earth recede in the background. So not having Earth there, I think that would be the biggest thing. And knowing that you don't have, there's no emergency return. You can't turn around and come back. You know, when we had Apollo 13, they were able to orbit the moon and come back because the moon orbits our planet. So we were still here. You go to Mars, Earth will then have moved on in its orbit and there is no free return trajectory. You actually got to go to Mars, wait for optimal alignment to come home. So you're going to be gone, you know, you got to be prepared to be gone regardless of how fast you get to Mars, probably two years. It's just a different mental prep. I could do it because I, I'd like to think I have the mental you know, fortitude to do that and I could learn the training. And I don't know if I should have done it when I'm younger 
or maybe when you're older that the risks are different and the, or the outcome from the risks you know you could handle in a different way mentally you have to really think about what you're leaving behind you know get my daughter married next year <laughs> it'll be easier to you know think about being gone but yeah but, but still the opportunity to do that you know to go to another planet the risk of getting back safely would be greater than anything we've sent humans on before um, so you have to weigh all of that and I guess you got in an in terms of my personal answer is I can see going. I would not have gone at certain points in my life. You know, there's the argument we're meant to explore and I, I feel that one pretty strongly, you know, so that says go. The cost involved is tremendous, so could you use that money other places? On the other hand, we use a lot of resources for things that I don't think are very productive. The risk, there will always be people ready to take on the risk. And so part of the risk decision is made by the people who want to see the program continue and if they have a bad outcome that, you know, that not only loses the life they lost, but it may shut down future efforts. So risk is tough to balance. But yeah, you know, I think we just need to go. The rover, I think they're doing better, you know, how far the rovers go when they're on the planet, but generally they go tens of kilometers in a lifetime. So that's not a huge part of the surface. And they have to move them really carefully because one misstep, so to speak, <laughs> on Mars and your rover gets stuck, you know, or can you get it off or can you, whereas a human could say, oh man, there's something over there and I'm just gonna go see what it is. And you have this, you know, real time ability to make adjustments to your science and your exploration and what you're doing. I don't think we will get there in my lifetime, but I hope somebody alive today gets to go. I think we will you know, eventually be able to explore our solar system. I hope they can get the cost down. You know, some of the biggest cost, reusability helps, but it just takes a lot of energy to get off our planet to start with. And then, you know, there's some good technologies being developed for maybe interplanetary transit where, and constant thrust may be a real way to offset microgravity for that long of a trip or something. And, but man, getting off the surface is costly. Crazy to me that it's been over 50 years since we've been to the moon. But you know, if it were easy, we would be back or some other country would have been back by now or some private, and you know, they may, they may get there. It is. And we learned, you know, when we were working initially on a program called Constellation that ended up kind of getting chain, morphed into what we have now for returning um, to the moon at NASA. But they, you know, when you, they just, I sat in meetings where they talked about once they went from a crew of three to even a crew of four, do you want to take some more? Or what if we make the capsule just this much larger so we can um, have a little more capability? That just multiplied through all kinds of complexity and mass and even safety for having some kind of uh, spin stabilization coming in where all of a sudden it didn't do that naturally. I mean, it just, yeah, you try to take more mass and it gets so much more difficult. We'd like to do more than taking three humans back and keeping one in orbit and landing two. You'd like to go back to stay. So it's very interesting now. They're talking about having a lunar outpost there, you know, in orbit, in a special gravity balanced orbit. It's a little different than a Newtonian orbit. So we're trying to come up with an architecture that takes longer to put in place, but hopefully creates a more stable way to keep going. And we don't have very many moonwalkers left anymore. And maybe maybe we'll make it before the last one is yeah. gone. I feel like there's a lot going on and that helps keep it in the public interest. Right. And NASA's gotten better too at promoting itself on social media, right. but there's just so much, you know, SpaceX does come to mind because they're always out there. Uh, they're good at their PR, um, you know. Hopefully Boeing will really get a human, their human rated capsule launched. You know, it passed the last test, so now we've got a crew waiting for a launch date. Right. And I hope they really you know, promote that. And I love the robotic missions that actually that go on. Those are great on all of the planets. I think it's all very exciting. Being on the campus here in Mizzou actually makes me want to go back to college. This is a really cool college town here in Columbia, Missouri. I think my sister will ultimately be very happy here. I know she was sad to leave her home in Oregon, but yeah, I hope that you guys really enjoyed this video. I feel like I could have talked to Linda for even longer. We talked 
a lot more off camera and she has just such an amazing story. She has done what she's wanted to do in her life and that's kind of the dream for all of us. There are several ways that you can support Ellie in space. Consider checking out my Patreon. You can also help me out by buying a t-shirt or a sweatshirt. I have some merchandise with my Ellie in space logo. I also have a Venmo if maybe you just want to compliment me to a cup of rocket fuel for the brain, aka coffee. And and I've just enabled my membership feature per your request. I know some of you don't necessarily want to go and make a Patreon, so it's so easy. You can just click a button and sign up for my membership of my channel. Thank you so much for checking out my channel. Please consider joining the club and hey, let's go to Mars. Mars.